And we give God thanks for the richness of the traditions that exist within the churches of God. It's really wonderful for us because I was thinking earlier, um, Rebecca's first Feast of Tabernacles, she was a baby in 1966. I think I've celebrated 42 or 43 Feast of Tabernacles, but I've never always done a big trip. And we've gone places, we've jumped on planes and trains and, and gone to a place where other brothers and sisters in the faith celebrate together. But never have I gone on Passover unleavened bread for a big sojourn, even though the scripture says, you know, three times a year, you know, a place where God anoints, etc. So all these different things came together. And for us, it's been one of the most meaningful and yet one of the most different seasons of Passover and unleavened bread. Because we looked at the de demographics, and Western Australia is a long way. And if you ever feel like a holiday away from home, we have some beds upstairs that we can use. And whether you stay a day or a week, you're all welcome. Um, this is what we have discovered. As we have travelled more recently in the last couple of weeks, we've stayed in Ballarat, we've stayed in Adelaide, and we've found brothers and sisters in the faith to open up their houses and their sense of... <coughs> Sorry, Mick? Yes, it is on. Yeah, that's fine. That's OK. She's making sure I'm all wired and I'm glad I've got such wonderful support. And we've really enjoyed the fellowship. And at this time of the year, when we get together, it's really important that we connect with brothers and sisters and, and look at what God's doing, where he's led us, and not carry a spirit of bitterness, but one of gladness. Because Jesus said, I've overcome the world. All power and authority has been given to me. And when we celebrate, as we do in our tradition, we have a lot to be grateful for. And I hope that these, this past week has been really significant and meaningful for you as it's been for us. I'd like to... It's been meaningful for our kids on many levels because we talked about a big drive across east. It took three days to Adelaide, another day to Ballarat, and, and um, two cars and, and all the adventure that goes with it. But in that sense of hospitality and connecting with brothers and sisters in the faith, we turned up at the Rollins place last night and there was kids everywhere and they're all having a good time. And many thanks to all those who've opened up their families and homes. We had the night to be much remembered with Paul and his family and a few others there. Absolutely wonderful. Because what we are celebrating are the richness of God. They found foundation in Scripture. And we find significant things, and we're going to explore a little bit about Unleavened Bread today, where we anchor our lives and the real things that really matter, that mean so much to us. You know, the disciples, did Jesus always prayed. He prayed, he gave thanks before he broke bread, and he found himself withdrawing from the masses' crowds, and the disciples would wake up in the morning and Jesus was gone. So eventually they, they said, Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. And we're all very familiar with the Lord's Prayer. It's part of our life. We use it as a model. It's, it's, I've heard it hundreds of times through countless sermons as the Lord's Prayer. But one of the words that stand out is, give us this day our daily bread. And when we think about it, we immediately think, oh, Matthew 6.33, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be yours as well. Talking about food, clothing and shelter. And give us this daily bread can really, yes, it can apply to our physical needs. But I think there's a more, a bigger meaning to what Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. It's a bigger picture because we're going to explore what Jesus meant when he said, I am the bread of life. And we go, ah, oh, ah. Oh. So you can hear, give us this day our daily bread on two levels. We're going to spend a few minutes just to explore it and understand what Jesus said in that, in that Lord's Prayer. Now in the tradition of the churches of God, we find ourselves celebrating the Lord's Supper or Communion or Passover, however you might understand it, and following that includes seven days of unleavened bread. That is, we don't eat fluffy white bread. In fact, in our tradition, we take it out of our houses. We say, what do you do that for? You can't, we can't take sin ourselves out of our lives. You know, otherwise, we negate the sacrifice of what Christ did for us. So why do we do this in our particular tradition? The kids ask us, are we going to eat right Vita again? And Mum says, oh, I found this nice soft mountain bread. It's great for a salad wrap, and it's really nice. And so, so for those seven days, we're going to explore the powerful reality of what we've just celebrated and what we've just eaten every day and what it's reminded us of. Because the first point of call with our children, when they're young, they begin to ask, well, why? Why are we doing this? Why is it relevant? Why bother? And aren't we under the terms of the new covenant? Isn't this all ancient Israelite stuff? And they're good questions to ask, whether you're an adult, whether you're a seeker Christian, or whether you've been a child coming up through the faith. So some of the material we're going to cover today, look, we've been there before. But doesn't this time of the year come around again every year? 
So we're going to explore scriptures that you're probably familiar with and find encouraging. Why do we do this? What's the point? What are we trying to convey by gathering today on Anzac Day? And we're not celebrating Anzac, we respect those who have fallen. Actually, it's quite appropriate in this hall on this particular day. But we're here for a bigger reason. See, right throughout history, bread has been the staple of life. The kids take it to sandwiches. Manna was the staple of life. It tasted like coriander seed, like fresh bread, etc. It's, um, I always encourage people, and the doctors do, have some carbohydrate before you begin each day. Don't launch into work without a good sound breakfast. Have some toast, have some cereal. The reason being, you're not necessarily feeding your body, you're feeding your brain. Your brain operates, it requires carbohydrate and it requires oxygen. So if you race off to work and you just eat an apple, that might keep you going with a bit of sugars. But the brain needs the carbohydrate. So you're sitting at work and you're thinking, what am I doing here? It is a staple and it is important for our, our lives. One of the interesting things if we go back in history is that the ancient Israelites were taken out of Egypt. They were a slave people. They had the slave mentality of 400 years. And God says, right, I've heard their cries, I've heard their suffering, I know your lot. Like we go through difficult times and challenging times and God hears and God answers. And this time we have the recorded history in the book of Exodus where God says, right, now I'm going to get busy. I've heard your prayers. And so during that time, God took them on a long journey. And we realise that physical human beings lose faith, and the ancient Israelites lost faith, and they complained. And if you study the scriptures, their complaining is listed on the same category as fornication. And that fell hard on God's ears. So God said, I'm going to let, let the next generation see the promised land. And so I'm delighted here that I'm the product of a second generation. Among us we're outnumbered by a younger generation of young people continuing in the word of God as God's spirit works in their lives and celebrating alongside with those who've travelled this journey many years the real things of God and the real things that point to his son Jesus Christ. So if we turn to Exodus 16, and you're probably familiar with it, is a story where God said, well, look, I want you to know what's holy and what's not holy. And I'm going to start with the seventh day Sabbath. I want you to rest. And I'm going to do it through bread. So what happened? God provided the ancient Israelites on their journey manna. And it was like in the morning there was a bit of a dew and there was a white thing and they'd collect it. And God says, for six days collect this manna. And on the sixth day collect a double portion for everybody. And that's what they did. And on Saturday morning, they went out and they tried to collect, and there was none there. And those who tried to collect a double portion during the other day of the week, it turned stinky. It had worms in it. And God says, oh, come on, guys. I told you what I wanted you to do. I want you to, to trust me on this. And so God gives them for 40 years what's called manna. And, and it was an enormous miracle that sustained them. It didn't affect their complaining. So if you look at Exodus, um, Exodus 16, you can follow the whole story. And my purpose here is not to go dot by dot exactly what happened thousand, um, probably three and a half thousand years ago. But if you think about it, 40 years is about 14,600 14, days. In that time, there was over 12,500 days of collection. And in that 40 years, there was 2,085 weeks to try to get a particular point home. All those years, that particular exercise, it sustained them, it's kept them strong. The story of manna, of course, comes out in the discourse that Jesus had with the disciples, with the Pharisees, the peoples of his day. We're using that as an anchor point today to be able to go in a particular direction because the ancient Israelites learned some of what was holy to God the sanctification of Sabbath rest. God says, I want you to take a break. I want you to understand that in this life, some things are holy and some things are not holy. Some things are every day. And I want you to make the distinction. And, um, and we wonder about that because, in, because there's a valuable lesson in for us as we come before the throne of grace and we want to follow God. We want to be disciples of Christ. We want to live in the path that God has called us by every word that comes from God. 
and we live in an increasingly secular society. So what we do here today, whether we, when we gather for church, is becoming a little bit out of kilt with the direction of our great Western nations. You know, our Prime Minister, six months before she took office, said Australia is now a secular country. But when I visit the cemeteries, we have a cemetery here in Ballarat with 25,000 pioneers. Most of those epitaphs have Christian sentiment on them. So I know that we came from a, a, essentially the roots of a Christian country. But we're forgetting. And we've forgotten the roots that we're coming. We, we've, we've, so it's essential that we hold on to those things that are really important. Look, I'm not going to spend any time in Exodus 16, but I will turn to John 6. Because Jesus reminds them of something powerful here and very encouraging in our walk today as we conclude today on this last day of unleavened bread. John 6 verse 32, Jesus said to them, Moses did not give you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. So the audience to which he was speaking held Moses up really high. Moses and the law. And then Jesus says, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. Didn't he? Didn't he? Well, it, wasn't it a miracle? Wasn't God involved in it? Yeah, he was. Jesus says in verse 33, For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And of course that begs the next question. Lord, give us this bread. Always. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. I'm going to take a little sip of water now, because I'm thirsty. I'm a physical human being. But there's a promise of Jesus about something bigger. That in your spiritual life, you never need be hungry. You never need to be thirsty. And that's encouraging on the journey that God called us. Because we're living in a secular society, isn't it a little bit like the wilderness that the ancient Israelites trekked? And I hope Christ returns within 40 years. We'll leave that to him, leave it to the Father. But God tells us that, that we never need hunger, we never need thirst. And Jesus was using the great lesson of 40 years imprinted in the minds of the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Judaic audience to which he was speaking that, that, that we will never hunger, we will never thirst. The ancient Israelites died and were buried. Didn't keep them living forever. The lesson is there. It's very encouraging because the lesson of the ancient Israelites and the lesson for us today and the lesson of these Passover and un Lord's Supper and the lesson of unleavened bread is Jesus Christ. Now some people l say, well look, let's focus on the message of Jesus and, le and too, we, too many people focus on the person of Jesus. Or others say, well, let's focus on the person of Jesus. You can't separate the two. Jesus says, I... Um, John says Jesus is the Word of God. He's the Word of God personified. We are to listen to every word that comes from Him. He says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. So, during those days of unleavened bread, every time you took a little piece of unleavened bread, we were reminded of what Jesus said. We took that little piece of bread and we ate it. And those of us who were baptised and celebrated the Lord's Supper of the Passover, did it in a, in, a, in a celebration and a commemoration and a proclamation of Jesus' death until he comes. But during these days we have been reminded, of, why are we doing this? And so when Rebecca and I went out to a restaurant in Adelaide, we took a little bit of unleavened bread with us. Not for the sake of, simply for the sake that we love the Lord. And for the sake of our tradition, to use a physical example to remind me of who God is and that I can't live without Christ in me. We're going to explore a little bit more of that. John 6 verse 47. John 6 verse 47. Jesus says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. The person who was healed, Jesus said, your faith has made you well. The power of belief and believing every word that God says, and trying, albeit in our brokenness, to live by God, to live by His word, to seek His will. I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. And I know that everyone here today believes. 
And Jesus' words reassures us. As Paul says, we have been crossed over, we have crossed over from death to life, though we don't yet see it. And that's encouraging. And it's really empowering because what we are going to see in our day, in the next generation, and the generation our young people are growing into, will may rock our faith. May give us reason to worry and say, ghastly, you know, we're being a bit outnumbered here. We're not the popular as we might have been a hundred years ago. Verse 48, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. A very interesting study if you study the I am statements through scripture. And the people of his day knew that I am was a powerful term, the way God reveals himself. Moses said, well, who shall I tell you sent me to Pharaoh? And God says, I am that I am. Leave it at that. And we try to comprehend that. 49, referring back to ancient Israel of John chapter 6. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. Ooh, they did die, didn't they? This is the bread which came down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. Now, I've eaten unleavened bread, but look, Paul and I joke, whose funeral we'll go to first, in a good sort of way, because I'm going to die. My mother died three years ago, and as I officiated a funeral, death stormed, stared us in the face. It's real. So eating unleavened bread is not going to save me in the physical sense. There's a bigger picture that Christ is trying to convey to us. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. So on the Passover service, when we took that little tiny crust of bread, we held it for a moment in our mouth. The significance was not lost on the people of God. And wherever you are in your understanding of who Christ is and what he's doing, who we are, where, where we are on the journey, how the Bible relates to humanity and salvation, there's some things that we can hold to. We are physical. If I scratched myself, a, a kitten the other day at the Rollins place jumped up on one of our kids or whatever, a little scratch, oh, there's a bit of blood. We are physical. And sometimes we learn our lessons through the physical experience that God has moulded us out of clay. Yes, we live in an adversarial environment where Satan and the devil and some of his demons exist. Did God allow that to happen accidentally? No, God knew what he was doing. And he knows what he's doing in the words of Jesus when he speaks to us today. And we find great encouragement from that. Let's continue in John chapter 6. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly in verse 53, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. We could be somewhere else, doing something else, playing sport, and in God's eyes we are good as dead. We are dead men. That's kind of interesting. Because in science, we realise that in four billion years this world's going to blow up, the sun's going to explode, and this, the, the mathematics is there. I trust the science. So we are freezing people and we're sending DNA out to the universe and hoping that we can find some form of eternal life and keep the human genome going and all these kinds of things. No, says God, apart from me, you are dead men. Jesus says, I am the way, the life and the truth. Whoever eats my flesh, in verse 54, and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The significance of the, Lord's, the Passover was when we took that bread and wine, we commemorated the Lord's death. Within 24 hours, Jesus was on that crucifixion stake or cross. He had nails in his hands and his feet, and some soldier rammed a spear into his guts, and there was the blood and the water that came out. And, but within three days of that, something happened. Now when I used to go to Passover as a boy, I, everyone was quiet and I thought, oh, this is hard to take. And they're washing my dad's feet. Ew! And what's this bread and wine? And I thought, the only thing that makes sense out of this, there's three days and three nights Jesus is resurrected. Wow, there's power in that. Jesus, I have the power to lay down my life and I have the power to take it again. And as a boy growing up in the faith, I held on to the resurrection. And when we celebrated the Passover service in Adelaide, one of my daughters said to me, Dad, that was the most meaning celebration and commemoration I've ever had. Because it spoke to her heart. And it spoke to our heart. Because if we celebrated the commemoration of the death of Jesus Christ without the power of the resurrection three days later, there's a bit of some sobriety that doesn't wake up. I know we feel sad at the resurrection, and for those who have no hope, there's an emptiness, a hollowness, a... A darkness. I brought a copy of a book of Hope and Resurrection today. If anybody wants a copy, we talk about that subject there. 
There is hope. There's awesome hope. And the hope exists in the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he who feeds in me will live because of me. Oh, sorry, verse 56. Oh, 55. My flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the Father has sent me, and I live because of the Father, he who feeds on me will live because of me. Now, I ate, I ate some jelly beans the other day, and they gave me a bit of a sugar burst. But the spiritual meaning wasn't quite there. Then we're having a little piece of mountain bread, unleavened bread, because I thought of Jesus Christ at that moment. There's no such thing as transubstantiation as some other Christians and other fellowships. Look, we respect their faith. But for us, that doesn't exist. It's a physical exercise we recognise. But the spiritual ramifications are very powerful. And God can speak to our inner soul. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Do you want to live forever? I have two songs on my MP3 player in the car, Forever Young. I want to be forever young. I like the beat, I like the song. But for me there's a spiritual reality. I wake up and see my mum, my grandmother in that resurrection. And we will be forever young. No more tears, no more crying, no more death, says God. For the former things have passed away. And we have confidence in that because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul explains it in Corinth, Corinthians. If the resurrection didn't occur, we as Christians are, are really twits. We are wasting our time. We are believing a myth. But if you believe, and look at the testimony of those men who wrote their witness accounts, that Christ was raised from the dead, there's power for that. Power for every man and living. Every man and woman living. Jesus said, Assuredly I'd say to you in John 5.26, that all who are in their graves will hear his voice. All who are in their graves. The power of resurrection, Jesus the firstborn, is that those who've lived righteously to a resurrection of life. And those who've done evil to a resurrection of judgment. These are Jesus' words. We can take courage, inspiration for the, for the sojourn. I said to my dad the other day, he's nearing 80, I said, oh, 27 years, I'll be old as you. And went, oh, wow, the years slip by. God gives us a few short years. And if you've been a part of the churches of God, no matter where you fellowship, you may have experienced this time of year for 30 or 40 years. The meaning doesn't get lost. Each year we view the same scriptures, listen to different voices, and our growth in Christ continues. You know, Jesus joins the dots for us. If the words of Jesus weren't recorded, if the discussions with Paul in the New Testament weren't there, we'd be living under an older umbrella called the Old Covenant. We wouldn't understand the significance of what we're doing. Did the ancient Israelites understand why they sacrificed, why they did this, why they waved, did the wave sheaf offering? They didn't understand. Maybe the Holy Spirit gave them a bit of insight. Jesus said to his disciples, look, the prophets and those of old long to look into the things that you guys are privy to. And 2,000 years old, oh, look, we have a, it's a miracle that we've got this book. Study the, the Bible as it's journey through hundreds of years, the Dark Ages, Tyndale and all those others that we take it for granted. We are blessed. We have concordances and Rebecca's looking at a scripture on an iPad. Incredible. It's there for us to view and there's no excuses. He who eats this bread will live forever. It's really worth looking into. And it's wonderful to walk this journey with the churches of God from every year, year to next. What is God doing with unleavened bread? And does the significance really rest on our hearts? As we look at ancient Israel, as we look at the, de the details that Jesus gives to us, as we look at Paul in Corinthians where he's talking to a Gentile church, and he said, therefore let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven of malice and wickedness, but the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And who's the truth? Jesus said, I am the way the life and the truth. And everything that we celebrate in all the colours focus on the reality of Jesus Christ, on his words and him as a person. Jesus Christ is the bread of life. And he's invited us to partake of that bread of life in him. And he's invited us to live forever and to really know God. We've never seen God. Paul was confronted on the road to Damascus. Did he see God? No, he was left blinded. He couldn't see. 
It took an anointing and a healing so he could see again. But Jesus confronted him. We couldn't, the presence of Jesus, we didn't, where was I reading this morning? Oh, in one of our hymns. Or was it in something I was reading this morning about Moses? Or in your message this morning, Moses was trembling and fainting when God approached, when he came into God's presence. We look forward to where, where the, the, the awe and the respect and the joy and the anticipation becomes reality at the day when Jesus resurrects us. That's encouraging. Oh well, I've jumped ahead of us. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 5. Corinth was a Gentile city, and yet in that Gentile community there were certain things that Paul spoke about. The ancient Corinthians understood the idea of leaven, and that it was going to spread through the whole lump. Jesus used that analogy. He said the kingdom of heaven is like yeast in a dough. It spreads through the whole lump. And he said, the kingdom of heaven is here. He also prayed, thy kingdom come. So when I see the increasing secularization in our community, I'm reminded of Jesus' words, that the, the kingdom of heaven spreads. So instead of thinking that the secularization of the world is spreading, I prefer to believe what I see in Jesus, that the kingdom of heaven is growing. And it might be only small, but it's growing within the Christian communities. And I'm glad for that. I'm really encouraged. Therefore, he says, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, and since you are truly unleavened. So those of us who actually went into the pantry cupboard and said, oh, the chooks were like those biscuits. Why did you do that? Well, throwing some leavened biscuits to the chooks are not going to save our lives. But there's a lesson in there. There's a lesson in there that we come before God and say, God, cleanse me. David prayed a prayer. Forgive me of my sins and I'll be whiter than snow. It's the prayer of confession when you come before God. But if you take a biscuit and put a cream cake for the chooks, they'll enjoy it. Um, but you're actually allowing the lessons of Scripture to permeate your heart. And God says, I will write your law, not on stone tablets in the Ten Commandments, I'll write them in your heart. Continuing, For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Here we are, New Testament church, long after Jesus had ascended to heaven, learning the lesson of unleavened bread. There's a lesson to be learned, and it's encouraging and inspiring. Let's go to John. John oh, actually, I don't, you don't need to turn there because I've already quoted it. John 14, 6. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And we're aware of that. Everything on this feast centres on Jesus Christ on his work, on his life, on his teaching, on his word, and the Holy Spirit that he sent us, that we can actually understand and make sense of these words and remember them. Because Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will bring to mind these things that we've said. And in, in, fact, in, in fact, if you get a, different, a difficult situation in life, because Christ lives in you, God says, when you come before and have to give a reason before kings or judges or magistrates, don't meditate before. The Holy Spirit will give you the words right there and then. Why? Because Christ is being formed in us. That's the reason. Otherwise, you'd have to prepare notes and hope for the best. And the best of human intention falls short. You know, Jesus' words said at the Passover, Do this in remembrance of me. The bread, the wine, the humility of service that we understand through foot washing. I think for me, this was Passover number 30 or 31 was probably the most meaningful. Same scriptures, same brothers and sisters in the faith, but brick upon brick, we learn a little bit more. We sense the presence of God. We understand what he's doing. And we have a little bit more that we can begin to give in sharing the gospel and being a light. So whether you've had matzos, whether these days you've had unleavened bread, mountain bread, whether you did, as one of my friends in Adelaide, got the rolling pin out and rolled something and, and you could test the, the home bake in it. We've been reminded of Jesus Christ, of the need for Christ to be formed in us. And we'll come to that in just a moment. You know, if we tur turn to Exodus 12, it's very interesting because the symbols, the symbols at the Passover are only for those who are baptised, the bread and wine. We invite others who are not baptised, welcome to participate in the foot washing, that's fine. But the symbols of the Lord's body must be taken with discernment and a full commitment, expressed through faith in baptism. But turn to, turn to Exodus 12. 
Because we understand that the days of unleavened bread are not only for those who are baptised. Scripture says everyone must eat. Albeit this is the shadow of the old covenant. There's things that we can learn from it. Exodus 12. I hope you find these words, the review of these words, powerfully encouraging. Exodus 12, verse 15. And you know these scriptures anyway. Oh, here we are. So, verse 14. So this day shall be a memorial. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord, to the Lord, as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast, as an everlasting ordinance. Verse 15. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. So under the terms of the Old Covenant, God says, I want you to learn the lesson like I've taught you Sabbath rest. Anybody who eats leavened bread, under the terms of the Old Covenant, you are out of the fellowship. On the first day there will be a holy convocation, and on the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation for you. No manner of work shall be done on the firm, but that which everyone must eat, but that which everyone must eat that may only be prepared by you. So this was everybody participated in the unleavened bread for those days, old and young alike. And the lesson would have been not lost on the children growing up through the ranks. Now, we have the benefit of hindsight of understanding a little bit of what God was in metaphor conveying to an ancient people. That apart from the Holy Spirit, you just can't understand. This is sort of a, a tradition, an exercise. Um, ghastly, if I don't eat unleavened bread, I'm, if I eat something accidental, ooh, like I ate an apple pie one day with a date. So I oh, was unleavened bread, we went out for a lovely date, and munch, 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 and went, ah. Oh. Well, we don't carry that kind of guilt today because we are talking about spiritual things. But we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because there's a lesson to be learned, an exercise of saying, I'm reminded again this week of Jesus Christ and what he gave for us. So, you know, even though it's only symbolic, it really means a lot. Because everything about, if you study all the feast days that we celebrate, they all centre on Jesus Christ, on his saving work, once you go and understand it, you go, wow. You refer less to Moses. And this was a hard thing for the, for the, for the people of, Jew, of Jesus' day, the Jews. So Jesus took Peter, John and James, took them up the Mount of Transfiguration, and then all of a sudden, in this vision, there was Moses and Elijah talking to, to Jesus. And a voice from heaven said, listen to him. This is my beloved son. You know, listen to him. Oh, but Moses stands tall. Elijah symbolises the prophets. Today we listen to the words of Jesus. We understand the backdrop that went before. We hold them dearly. That's why we eat unleavened bread. Because the pattern finds itself in Scripture. And if we walked with Jesus Christ, he probably would be sitting at this table talking about unleavened bread in a way that would lift our hearts and minds more than I can, apart from the Holy Spirit given to us. You know, the Apostle Paul gives us in a throwaway line. Turn to Galatians 4.19. You know, it's not a throwaway line. Sometimes we, re we look, it actually defines Paul's ministry. Paul was called on the road to Damascus. Jesus said, I will show him how much he must suffer for me, for my name's sake. Galatians 4.19. Paul appeals to the people there. He said, my little children for whom I'm labour and birth until Christ is formed in you. When we are resurrected, what does God see? He sees the righteousness of Christ. That's encouraging. And so this journey that we are celebrating on in our tradition is until Christ is formed in us. And to me, for the last six months, Galatians 4.19 has been a keynote scripture. It's not a throwaway line. It's a pivotal point of what the scripture is all about. Until Christ is formed in you. That's what these days are all about. That's what the calling of God is in in your life. That's why you choose at a certain point in your life. And we have a lot of young people. And eventually you'll feel the call of God, if you're not doing so already, to say, I know that I want to live this way of life. And I want to have an outward expression of my faith in Christ. I have walked, I have understood, and now I want to commit fully to Christ. So you're dipped in the waters of baptism. You have, you're raised out of that watery grave. You have hands laid on you. You receive the Holy Spirit. And from that moment onwards, Christ is being formed in you. 
That's why we are resurrected to the resurrection of life. It's not because we are righteous. It's not because we eat unleavened bread and they don't. No, that's not even a part of the equation. It's because Christ is formed in us. We understand that we cherish that. And that's a part of everyday life. And that's so encouraging. And it changes our anchor. Because everything that we have do, everything in Scripture, everything that we celebrate, focuses on Jesus Christ. They picture Christ. And Jesus Christ is the only way. There's no other way. I remember a senior pastor brought attention to me some years ago about Christ among other gods. And you see eucumenical services where you have many faiths outside the Christian faith coming together to pray and worship together. And that falls short on the righteousness of God because Jesus said, I am the only way, the truth and the life. Peter says, there's no other way except through Christ. And I'm paraphrasing there. We are reminded through these days that apart from Jesus Christ, we are good as dead. And God has given us a wonderful message and a wonderful journey that we can't keep to ourselves. That's why the nature of the church's God has been involved in outreach and evangelism and, and fellowship and feast events to invite the greater community that there is a God, that he's called us to life. Because our children go to schools where they learn there is no God. They learn that we evolved from the single cell amoeba, etc., etc. The glory for the great intelligence, the great learning of this world doesn't go to God. So we have work to do, if not out in the greater community, within our own fellowships and house churches and, and areas. That Jesus Christ is the only way. So I hope that these days have been of value to you. That, remember the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned? God, or prior to that, God says, the moment you eat of this tree, you will surely die. That's what sin is. It alienates us from God. We will die. And Satan comes along and he says, you won't die. You're going to become like God, knowing good and evil. And Eve says, Eve says of course I want to be like God. And, I, and it tastes good, looks good, tastes. Did Adam and Eve die at that moment? Well, no. God chased them out of the Garden of Eden. He said, you're not going to touch the tree of life. So he put the big sword there with cherubim there. But they did die. And you read the scriptures, and we're not going to go there today, about the first Adam and the second Adam. And the expression of God's love for all humanity, for God so loved the world. A keystone scripture for all Christians, no matter where they are. And he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall be not perish but have eternal life. He died for the sins of the world. I'm glad for that. Otherwise, the devil has victory because Eve took of that. But we also understand that Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. I read a scripture the other day that Christ was foreordained before the world and slain from the foundation of the world. And we understand this is not just an accident. No, Jesus came willingly for that purpose. He laid down his life. He took it up again. He's in the Father and he said, according to the Father, I will return. A certain nobleman went to a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then to return. Of the many parables that Jesus told, he is coming back. Not as a suffering saviour this time, but King of kings and Lord of lords with might and fury and power and judgment. We look forward to that time. How long it will be? The Father knows. Let's remain faithful. Let's remain strong. Jesus said at the Passover, do this in remembrance of me. We forget. Unless we celebrate these days and a reminder, we could go to work seven days a week like the ancient Israelites. Did they remember God? No, in 400 years they'd lost God. I the Levites remembered there were some vestiges of things that stayed. God always preserves a remnant through society. We know that. We've seen that historically. We are part of that journey. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. So he does say us to do some things. Physical participation, expressions of faith. It's encouraging, it's strengthening, it's empowering. In all that we do, in all that we are, as Christ is being formed on us, may we in the year ahead reflect Christ, reflect his will. After tonight, hey, let's go and get a pizza. For the kids that means something, you know, for us too. Oh, I sat in a restaurant in Adelaide and there was a beautiful fresh garlic bread. I'm sitting there and one of my mates said, John, go on. Oh, he said, I forgot about you. Oh, yeah, sorry. You know, the conversation, we laugh about it. But in that moment, I was reminded of Jesus, the distinctiveness that God calls us to celebrate, to participate, to immerse ourselves in. You know, John 6.51, we visited that. He who feeds in me will live forever. I'm going to go back there again because I think it's really significant. John 6. 
Don't labour for the food which perishes, but the food which endures for eternal to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. These are the words of Jesus that speak to us today. And they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? So that could be our question today. God, what do you want me to do? That my life works your work. That my live, life is lived according to your will. What shall we do to, that we may do the works of God? And Jesus said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. And when you believe, and when you have faith, James said, it follows by your actions, by the person you are and the things you do. Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform for us that we may see it and believe you? There's a carnal mind saying, Do us a trick again. Give us some more bread. Show us it. What work will you do? And so they quote scripture. Our fathers ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So people can take scriptures and we can concoct something and say, See God? Remember Satan quoted scripture to Jesus on the temptation mount? Listen to Jesus' words. Most assuredly I say to you in verse 32, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God, which is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Oh, wow, that sounds good. Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. When Jesus was crucified shortly after that, there were two other men, criminals. One scoffed. The other one said, Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. And Jesus said, verily I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Really? Was he baptised? No. We learn a lot from that particular example. Was he a righteous man? Well, he might have had unleavened bread when he was a boy, but finally confronted with his sins and the reality of the Messiah beside him, there was a moment of confession. Listen to what Jesus says. Very, very powerful. He who believes in me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. On that crucifixion stake, those guys were thirsty. They were suffering. They had blood loss. The Psalms say, my roof cleaves to the, my tongue cleaves to the roof of my, my mouth. And you read Psalms and Isaiah and you see the, the loss of liquid in the human body. Jesus says, you'll never hunger, you'll never thirst. And though that man was dying on the cross next to Jesus, that moment he was quenched by the presence of Christ being formed in him. It's kind of encouraging, kind of strengthening. It doesn't mean that we can slack off. Because God has called us on a journey and he entrusts us with those things that he's given us. The servant who only had one talent and buried it and did nothing with it and said, oh, I'll wait till my Lord comes back and all will be okay. No, it doesn't work that way. We know the story, I might go into it. What you were eating these last days symbolised the bread of life. Symbolised sincerity. It symbolised truth. It symbolised the work of Jesus Christ being formed in us, Galatians 4.19. If this year has come and gone and you've been busy and distracted or circumstances have, you've had a pressing bank, de bank creditor on your doorstep or you've been busy and things, you haven't had the time to pray this year or yes, you know, you've celebrated for 40 years and it's sort of been a bit mundane and, and at the end of Unleavened Bread you thought, I've really enjoyed these worship services and the things and sermons have stored out. I wish I'd had taken more time to meditate. I wish I'd taken more time to discern the Lord's body in the symbols of the Passover. Hey guys, we're going to do this again next year. Maybe you'll be here, maybe you'll be fellowshipping elsewhere, we don't know. But you'll be among brothers and sisters in the faith. Where two or three are gathered, says Jesus, there I am among them. So if this year has come and gone, and you're sort of now thinking, yeah, yeah, I sort of take Jesus a bit lightly sometimes. I really want Jesus as the centre of my life. Well, you have another year. We have another year. God is gracious. He allows time and circumstances to mould and shape and direct and guide us. We have a lot to be grateful for. God gives us time to learn and grow. So I hope these days have been encouraging. I hope Jesus Christ fills your thoughts. Make sure, kids, when you get up in the morning, give God praise. If you're in a hurry, say a short prayer, then no prayer. Allow God to be the centre of your life. Because one day, you will have kids. And God will provide for you to the next generation. I'm the second generation. So is Paul here, so are many of you. We don't give credit that, oh, wow, great, you know. No. This is the work of God. We trust him. We ask him every day, God, strengthen us. Please encourage us. We pray for one another. And we look forward to the other worship occasions when we go together. So may God strengthen us.
by his grace. May he fill you with his spirit. May the bread of life be something that you eat every day of every year, not just for seven days. May we be strong, loving, courageous, for the only reason, because Christ lives in us. It's been wonderful to be here today. Our family has had a wonderful time fellowshipping. We've sensed the love among the people of God wherever we've gone. Later this year we're heading to the US for the feast. We're looking forward to that. But in our um, 40 plus year sojourn, God has blessed us. Here we are today, loving God, seeking his will, exploring the scriptures with renewed hope and energy. So may we continue in faith and love one another and encourage and inspire and bless and look forward to next year because again we'll celebrate the same things with renewed insight. May God bless.